Yeah. Great. So uh, we want to welcome everyone. We're so excited for this event. Um, it's not every day that you get to um, talk about your research with one of your sheroes. Um, so uh, first, I guess uh, we're grateful to McNally Jackson for co-hosting uh, this webinar. Um, I'm Jennifer Hirsch. I'm a professor at Columbia University. Seamus. And I, I'm Seamus Khan. I'm also a professor at Columbia University. Together, we are the co-authors of Sexual Citizens. Um, we are over the moon to be sharing the webinar tonight uh, with uh, Assemblywoman Yuli Liu. Um, in 2016, Yulin was elected to serve the 65th Assembly District, representing the Lower East Side, China, Chinatown, the South Street Seaport area, the Financial District, and Battery Park City. But that's just the most recent step in a career working on legislative and advocacy campaigns that goes back for a pretty long time. She began working in state policy in college, eventually accepting a position with the Washington State House Health Committee Chair. While there, she helped develop policies to expand senior access to prescription medication, improve women's health care, and expand health coverage for low-income families. Yulene then went on to work as an advocate and organizer on anti-poverty issues, where she helped build a broad coalition to fight predatory, predatory lending and assist low-income families build financial assets. She served as chief of staff for New York State Assembly member Ron Kim, where under her leadership, the office assisted thousands of immigrants, small business owners, teachers, seniors, workers, and students. She has drafted legislation to expand language access for immigrant communities and has fought for more affordable housing and expanded services for seniors. In the assembly, Yulene has continued her advocacy work around financial empowerment. She has pushed to improve financial protections for consumers, particularly for unbanked communities. On housing, Yulene has worked to secure funding for New York City Housing Authority repairs and has stood with tenant rights advocates for better housing regulations. Along with her colleagues, Yulene helped for, form New York State's first ever Asian Pacific American Legislative Task Force, which will focus on advancing issues impacting New York's Asian American community. She also is full of recommendations for where you should eat dumplings. So she, she really pretty much like knows everything. Yulene completed her master's degree in public administration at CUNY Brew College as part of the National Urban Fellowship Program, where she worked on regional and international environmental issues. She lives in the financial district in lower Manhattan. For those of you who missed seeing Yulene up on stage with Elizabeth Warren in Washington Square, I just want to be clear. She is a rock star, and I'm actually not talking about Elizabeth Warren. A recent piece on her legislative leadership during COVID-19 said this, New is a passionate advocate for her constituents, a grassroots organizer, and a woman who pulled off a surprise victory in the insulated, in the insular male-dominated world of politics. Seamus and I are beyond thrilled and deeply honored to be in conversation with her tonight. Um, before we get started with our conversation, I just want to give a content warning. Um, it's important to note for everybody who's gathered with us that our discussion of sexual citizens will contain descriptions of actual sexual assaults as students experience them. This material can be hard to listen to, and we know that in every room, virtual or not, there are survivors. Um, I'll drop the RAIN hotline number in the chat window. Please take care of yourselves and know that you are not alone. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Yulene. Thank you so much um, for being a friend, for um, having this conversation with me. And um, I have just so many questions. I'm sure that a lot of folks, for folks who um, are kind of uh, here to hear about the book, um, for folks who want to know more about the book, for folks who kind of want to hear about, a little bit about the experience of reading the book as a survivor, um, we're here to talk about all of that. Um, this is the book. This is what it looks like. Um, it's really beautiful, actually. Uh, and, and I just wanted to say that, you know, when I first read it, it was actually really hard for me to read it. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you for uh, Jennifer and Seamus for writing it, for doing this research, and for being so easy to talk to. Um, I felt like uh, reading the book was um, was healing in a way. And so I think that a lot of people might take away from it in that way as well. Um, and I just wanted to kind of, uh, I guess, just open it up with a couple of questions to you, if that's okay. Um, right now, I'm actually in the middle of session. 
Um, I wanted to let folks know that. So if I look in this direction, it's because I'm technically still on the floor, um, but from my kitchen, which you can see. Um, <laughs> so this is kind of a, an interesting thing because um, they're in the middle of a very large um, healthcare debate that actually you might even care about because it's about the definition of clinical peer review. No, we, <laughs> you got the right crew here. You got no, the right no, crew. I will show it to you. It's, a, it's, it's legit right here. It's on mm-hmm. clinical peer review. And wow, you're like you're like expanding the definition <laughs> of multitasking. Yes, yes. Well, this is that's what's happening right now. And so, um, because I already voted yes for this bill, um, I'm I'm good. So if I look in this direction, that's what's happening. But I wanted to uh, just kind of open up with you know, for me, one of the takeaways was. Um, a little bit more language, a, a little bit more uh, ability to kind of uh, say what I wanted to after I read your book. And also, uh, I feel like one of the other things was that healing that I was talking about. But what do you think pe- you're hoping that people take home from reading this book? Our take home, um, we'd like to change the conversation. I mean, it's sort of an immodest aspiration, but So much of the conversation around campus sexual assault has focused on adjudication, on the sort of sociopathic perpetrator, the campus as a hunting ground. And, um, you know, there are certainly people on campus who seek to deliberately harm people, but now everyone knows what public health is, right? All of a sudden, we're in like the most public health of all moments, and um, we want to expand the, well, we're going to get there. Um, (laughs) Um, we wish. Yeah. And we want to ex- expand the conversation about campus sexual assault so that um, people are thinking about preventing all of that suffering. I, actually, I'm going to back up a little bit and tell a story. Um, so Austin was one of the students who we spoke with, in some ways, um, a very sympathetic character. He um, cared so much about being a good lover that he had... Uh, invented nicknames for the kinds of orgasms that his girlfriend would have. And he, he was really, you know, wanting to deliver those orgasms. So that is a, um, gives you a sense of how he had grown into a caring person. And yet he told us a story about being in a room with someone freshman year. Um, it was uh, his roommate's girlfriend's roommate's room and he was shuffled off there. So the roommate and the girlfriend could be together. Um, they were not, it, they, there was no relationship there and she was very drunk and she said to him that she didn't want to do anything and and yet he got in bed with her and started to touch her body and um and then he stopped himself and he thought you know this this isn't the thing um, but he had never labeled that an assault um and years later in telling us the story he came to label it an assault and was overcome with emotion he paused and he was like, fuck me. You know, he just, he, cause he, he, in that moment felt like he was, he couldn't put together who he had become with, with what he had done. Um, and our goal in sexual citizens is to invite people into doing the work of having that not happen. Uh, you know, what, what can we do to prevent that, that assault from happening? I thought that was particularly interesting when you were talking about that story, because one of the other stories that stuck out to me was, uh, Norman, um, who, I mean, you, you, I, I think you guys labeled him Norman because his names are changed, but you might have labeled him Norman because he's a normie, you know, he's like a, <laughs> the, the blue-eyed, blonde-haired white guy, right, who uh, basically um, went through and he, w- he had different labels for things. He would use words in a different way, and he said that he felt like, you know, there were things that he didn't consent to, but it wasn't that he didn't consent to the sex, it was that he didn't consent to having sex with somebody that he felt was beneath beneath his social status. And that was a very interesting story. And the way that you you wrote it was, you know, it it was obviously the way that this whole book is written to make it, um, so there was no judgment of it, but like I felt myself as a person of color, as a woman, as like somebody who is uh, gender, like, you know, like, just like I, I'm cisgendered, but I'm also like somebody who's also with the within the LGBTQ community, and like somebody who has uh, a, um, a history of being with uh, non-gender conforming partners, and then like having that kind of 
um, background and then coming reading his story, I was definitely judgmental. So some of the things that, you know, um, were happening within the book uh, made me feel a certain way like that. And, and a lot of the things that I came up, out with was also um, some of the definitions, like I was saying. And one of the things that, um, that, I, that I kept on seeing throughout the book was consent practices. Um, and that and that framing and that terminology. Could you tell us about you know I guess like within some of the um, within some of the book and some of the ways that you talk about consent within the book and how people reach certain um, thoughts of what consent looks like and uh, sounds like and feels like? Because there was also the story of Diana, right? Who um, also came to realize that somebody who did say yes was not. And so um, could you tell us a little bit about that as well? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the, the, the stories that we tell, as you, as you indicate, like we, we sort of stand outside of judgment because of the method that we use. And the method that we use is an ethnography. And what that means is that you sort of try and make sense of people's worlds as they see it. Yeah. And, then, and then you use that to try and figure out ways in which you might create a better world. And sometimes, like, standing in judgment, like, and be believe us, like, Jennifer and I had times where we were just cringing and having, like, you know, like, a really difficult time with what people had told us. But our perspective is you have to understand why people are doing what they're doing from their point of view in order to make sense of it. And consent, as you just said, is actually a really interesting example of this because yeah. so much of what we tell young people about consent is kind of like, it's this like binary, like was there or wasn't there consent? And like, did you elicit a yes? And if so, it was consensual. And if not, then it wasn't consensual. And yet there are story after story in the book of, I mean, let's be clear. There are story after story in the book of assault where people didn't get consent, but should have gotten consent. And it was like a clear violation, but there are lots of other stories you know, um, stories of like Maddie in the book who um, was transitioning and identified as genderqueer and who no longer wanted to use their penis during sex and their partner pressured them to do it, saying things like, you don't think I'm beautiful. And Maddie knew how much that hurt as a genderqueer person to be told, you don't think I'm beautiful, and eventually consented to sex that they didn't want to have. And for us, you know, we sort of think like we use a driving analogy a lot in the book and we think about consent as something that's very important, but teaching young people that sexual assault is all about consent is like teaching people to drive where you only say, okay, you just have to stop at stop signs and red lights. And if you got that, you know how to drive. And as it turns out, like driving is a complicated behavior and you need to know more than just stop signs and red lights don't get us wrong. You need to know stop signs and red lights, but you need to know lots of other things like, you know, when to merge and how to respect the rules of the road and when it's not okay to get into a car. And we spend a lot of social effort trying to teach young people those sets of things. This might not speak as well to a New York crowd that maybe doesn't have a driver's license, but for a lot of us, you know, there's a lot that goes on to teaching people how to drive. And Sex is a similar activity. It's not just about stopping at stop signs and going at green lights. It's a complex social activity. And what Jennifer and I try to do is sort of socialize the sexual experience. That is to talk about how it's embedded in friendship networks and embedded in people's status projects and help make sense of how that embedding has consequences for the ways in which people have sex, including consensual and non-consensual sex. I thought in particular, so I love, I, I, I tried to keep a straight face, but when you said when to merge for the analogy, I was still I was like, that's very funny. But, <laughs> but um, we laugh. Yeah. <laughs> that happened. I'm sorry. That was like um, <laughs> my brain. But um, I just wanted to also, um, you know, say that when, uh, when, when you're talking about that, there's also the fact that, um, you know, within that, uh, that kind of, uh, I guess, clinical study of um, how things work on campuses and how to talk about things within somebody, uh, uh, somebody else's framework. Um, I think that uh, we also, um, you know, I, I think that 
a lot of the stories at the very beginning, obviously, are undeniably more difficult to read um, because they are the ones who, um, uh, you know, are, well, for me anyway, as somebody who is also a sexual assault survivor, for folks that don't know, um, I, 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 when, when, when Jennifer was talking about how, um, how on campuses uh, there are certain kinds of creepy behaviors and normal lives, um, I was actually sexually assaulted by my teacher. Um, I was I was in high school. Um, I was just a kid, and um, and it was a very different kind of campus. Obviously, it wasn't student to student, peer to peer. Um, it was something else. And um, I think that there is um, power dynamics as well that you really do a good job of framing within the book. And I think that um, when we're talking about different power dynamics, when we're talking about, um, and you just had mentioned about, uh, you know, uh, somebody coming out and uh, newly coming out and discovering their own gender identity and sexual identity, um, I think that there's also a power dynamic there uh, that are not really talked about a lot within um, these different frameworks of sexual assault. I think that there's power dynamics um, even within, you know, it's not just like male-female, and you guys talk about that in the book as well. I think that there's um, a lot of different power dynamics to explore. I would love to be able to explore some of them with you now. So I think, it, and it, I mean, that is at its heart one of the key messages of the book that that gender, you can't think about sexual assault without thinking about gender inequality. Most assaults are committed by cis hetero men and experienced by cis hetero women just because of the, the, the population distribution. But um, if you only think about gender, there are so many forms of power that you miss. Um, one of the stories in the book, um, Lucy, Lucy was a freshman and she uh, you know, started, she had gone to boarding school, um, very protected, and she was really excited to start school, lose her virginity, um, party, be popular. She went to a party, uh, she went to a bar, and she met, she and her friend uh, met two seniors. And um, she, people can read about it, I'm not going to tell the whole story, but she ended up being raped um, by a senior in his fraternity room. Um, she said to him, no, don't. And he said, it's okay. And like, every time I tell that story, it, it, I feel it's, it's awful. And um, in that moment, if all you think about is that Scott, the pseudonym, that, that he was a man and she was a woman, you miss so many forms of power. So you miss the fact that he was probably three years older and that he probably weighed 40 pounds more than she did and was a couple inches taller and was in a room on the third floor of a building where he was surrounded by his friends on a campus where he knew how people acted and she didn't. So there were all kinds of social power. Um, there's frequently economic power disparities. We found that in the survey that was um, associated with this larger project that the research comes from, we found that students who experienced financial insecurity were more likely to experience sexual assault. Um, and then, um, in Sexual Citizens, we, we unpack, we go far beyond gender to talk about race as a form of inequality that produces vulnerability to sexual assault um, and queerness. So I think, so it's, you know, that last chapter is gender and beyond because gender is so fundamental. Um, that's sort of the, the, our work is grounded in uh, the notion of intersectionality, but you can't just get there with thinking, with, with thinking about gender. You have to go beyond it. Yeah, I mean, so much of what Jennifer and I try to do is, you know, a lot of books and academic articles are written where there's like the race chapter and the class chapter and the sexuality chapter. And it's like, here's the general experience. And then here's the particular experience of black people, the particular experience of queer people. And the way in which we tell stories in the book is that we interweave all of those stories together. So queer people appear in every single chapter. We tell stories about race across the entire book. And it's partially because, you know, Jennifer and I, you know, the point of the book is prevention. It's about how to prevent sexual assault. But I think, you know, one of the big overarching points is one of the best prevention techniques is a commitment to equality, broadly conceived. 
And that means class equality, that means racial equality, it means equality in terms of sort of the, the respect for persons. Um, sexual citizenship itself as a concept is a concept embedded in equality. It's the idea that you have the right to sexual self-determination, but everybody with you, that you're with has that same equivalent or equal right. And so that's really kind of what the book is about. And it says that, you know, it's not that sexual assault prevention is going to happen in the women's studies center or in the like, you know, women's health center. It's got to be part of a broad based commitment to equality. That's how we get there. So there's two things that just struck me as you were speaking, um, as both of you were speaking. Um, one of them, when you were talking about, um, you know, how uh, Jennifer, when you were talking about how, you know, pers- like numbers wise, the cases are generally with heterosexual males heterosexual women um, in cis, cisgendered males and cisgendered women. But um, th- as we know, there's a higher rate of assault um, with queer students. Um, and I mean, that's just percentage wise within the smaller population of folks numbers wise. Um, so how do, how, like, what does that mean? And like, how do we, you know, everything's interconnected as Seamus was saying, but like, how do we help to, look at that issue in particular just due to the numbers and also um, due to the power differential. Yeah, I mean, you know, the queer experience is so important in part because, you know, it's not that gender fi- Jennifer and I argue against toxic masculinity. Like, there are clearly problems with toxic masculinity. We cannot live in the world today and think that toxic masculinity isn't a problem. Well, I guess you well, can. like Norman. <laughs> I mean, the story of Norman. You know, like, a man who describes a woman as, like, three-day-old pizza, like, I, that's emblematic, that's... <laughs> right? That was, like, something that struck out to me. <laughs> yeah. So it's not that we deny toxic masculinity, but... We also say, like, toxic masculinity doesn't really explain what's happening among queer students or why it is that queer students have such high rates of assault. But what does is the continual denial of queerness by families, institutions, by the context within which young people are growing up, and then the institutions that they find themselves in. And so queer students are particularly at risk of assault because of the continual denial of their sexuality that they experience, because, you know, they don't they're not taught to see themselves as legitimate sexual actors or given the language or education to think about themselves as legitimate sexual actors. And they're often in the most precarious or fragile positions where exiting relationships can be really consequential. So in the story, in the book, we tell the story of Adam and Adam is um, he's a gay man who's from, you know, the Midwest and from a fairly conservative family. And, you know, they're not supportive of him being gay and, um, He gets to New York and he's super excited, but he's also really disappointed because as much as he's like in this deep tension with his family about his sexuality, they also have like a huge values impact upon him. He wants to be in a relationship. He's sort of like sick of grinder and sick of like meeting up with guys who say they want a relationship only just to like hit it and quit it, like walk away and ghost him and never talk to him again. And so he finally gets into this relationship with this guy and he's so happy about it. He's happy about his relationship. But over the course of the interview, he says to us, you know, one of the problems is like my boyfriend's really forceful at sex. And then he tells us the story about how his boyfriend came home one night really drunk. And in Adam's words, he basically raped me. And, you know, how do we make sense of that experience of Adam of being raped in that moment and refusing to talk about it as rape, refusing to talk to his boyfriend about it? He just felt like he found something so special in that relationship, something so special in like having this moment of being seen in his own queerness that he wasn't willing to sort of challenge it in any way. And I think, you know, being feeling like he's in this very precarious position is something that a lot of queer people know in terms of an experience that we have. And so I think for Adam, like, you know, he's actually kind of one of the most, you know, as, as a gay man, a gay white man, um, probably in one of the most powerful positions in the queer people we speak to, but for him and so many other people, we heard this same story. And I'll just say two big lesson take-homes from this for us was one, you know, being in a relationship is not protective of us all. Being committed to relationships and other people can actually put you at risk as it did in Adam's case. And that happens in queer relationships. It happens in straight relationships. It happens in all kinds of relationships. 
And the second is that one of the challenges for assault is like assault isn't one thing. It's lots of different kinds of things. And that's why on like the legislative agenda or on the like consent education piece, there's no silver bullet. We can't just teach people consent education. It's going to go away. It would be like, if you just make sure you're in a relationship, it's going to go away. Or if we just say like, you know, we just need to do this one thing. It's because the ways in which people are assaulted, you know, dozens of stories you hear throughout the book and the, the lives that people live, it's a real different set of experiences that people have with assault that are going to require different interventions. Yeah. Um, there's a, I mean, so right now, I guess we'll just start talking policy, I guess, because you just mentioned some of it. Um, but, you know, there's a bill right now that I, I'm a co-sponsor of that um, one of my friends, sexual, uh, uh, sexual assault prevention, um, that uh, my friend Alejandro Biaggi, who you spoke to before, um, is also the main sponsor on, um, on the Senate side that, um, would require schools to provide comprehensive sexuality education um, to empower and educate our students to make responsible decisions um, about their sexual health um, and kind of destigmatize uh, talking about that physical, emotional, and social aspects of like human sexuality, et cetera. But there's also um, a couple of other bills that we did on sexual harassment prevention, um, on sexual assault prevention, um, in, like the workplace, which is crazy that it's like it wasn't prohibited um and can you kind of talk a little bit about you know why comprehensive sex ed is so important and um you know i know that some of the things that you said in the book about it being a little earlier is also really important and um you know would love to be able to see uh you know how we can have those honest conversations within our institutions as well yeah comprehensive sex ed is a strategy that we know would work to prevent some sexual assaults. Going back to the driving agenda or the driving um, metaphor, you don't um, let your kids grab the keys at night when they're drunk and like you just sort of turn away and you're like, well, I hope it goes okay for them, right? And instead, like there's a whole program that teaches them how to drive. And we were astonished by the sexual illiteracy of some of the students with whom we spoke. I mean, it was one. Um, student we spoke with, he was not American. Uh, his girlfriend was, and she was from a state that has abstinence-only education. And he was horrified that she told him, she's like, you can just pull out. It'll be fine. He's like, what are you talking about? It won't just be fine. Um, he said, he's like, she didn't even know where her holes were. So like, it was, but I mean, that's a socially produced ignorance, right? That's a policy choice. Um, the survey that was part of this larger project at Columbia, an analysis of those data, which led by my husband, John Santelli, um, the paper found that women who'd had comprehensive sex ed before um, college that included teaching them how to say no to sex they didn't want to have, which is not abstinence-only sex education. It's just education that includes a skills development component. Those women were half as likely to be raped in college. So that is a really powerful effect. And another paper that I worked on actually mapped out all of the ways in which sex ed can teach people not to assault people, right? Because we shouldn't only be teaching people not to be raped with this, like our fundamental job is to be teaching people not to hurt each other. But we're just, we're not doing a very good job as a society at teaching young people to become sexually active in a way that isn't harmful to other people. And we can, you know, you can sit in judgment on Norman. I mean, I felt pretty judgy about Norman when I was writing that story. Um, or, you know, you can think, okay, Scott, maybe he's a terrible person, but like that is not going to move us towards prevention and we want change. And so that's um, part of why we tried to hold the, the young people whose stories we tell in the book with compassion. The book, I know it was an agonizingly hard read for you. And I, I was so, I mean, we had our conversation. Before. Yes, I was very, I was very touched by, by what you said. And I think as books about sexual assault go, I hope you agree with us that like, ultimately, it's a pretty hopeful vision. We feel like there's so much that we could do on the policy level. And it starts with comprehensive sex ed. Um, that would uh, help young people grow up into sexual citizens. I don't think like we should just be moving our, like just just to talk about the, this conversation, just to talk about it, right? I think it really should be about 
uh, making sure that we change our laws for the better. And I think that that's something that we really need to kind of hold us, uh, I, I guess, hold ourselves accountable to, but also kind of um, have um, some kind of gold standard, right? Because I think that without um, without this kind of research, I think that we wouldn't be able to have um, these conversations, even have the language to have these conversations for um, so many of our students. But I, 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 I loved that you wrote in a non-judgmental fashion as much as I was judging. <laughs> um, I was just like, oh, three-day-old pizza, how can you say that about a girl? And, and, and there, were, there were things that, you know, of course, like I, I said, um, were hard uh, to talk about, but we do need to have some way of um, being able to have those honest and open conversations about um, sex, sexual assault, and particularly with um, teenagers, young adults. Um, and so, you know, because we have that culture of shame, right? There's a culture of shame. There's a culture of, of guilt. And then on top of that, I think that there's even more of it within communities of color um, because, for example, I mean, I would just say this from my own community, but we don't even have words for things because in Chinese, like, I couldn't even tell my parents what had happened to me in school in Chinese. Um, I couldn't even describe it to them because my parents did not, I mean, the words exist. So they did not give me the language as a child to be able to have that discussion with them because it was something that was so taboo. Um, it's something that they could never imagine happening. And so they never gave me the language to describe it. Um, and I think that because we don't have those conversations as um, parents to child, it makes it so that um, when something did happen, I couldn't even describe it to them the way I needed to, to get through to them, to tell them what exactly happened. And I think that, um, you know, I think that that's something that happens a lot because there is language disparities. There's um, certain kinds of, um, you know, stigmas attached to things. And, you know, mine definitely was, uh, you know, that when my parents, I, I told Jennifer this when we were talking, but when my parents were trying to help me by trying to give me normalization, I felt even more hurt because I felt like they were trying to, um, they, that they weren't acknowledging it and they didn't want to admit that I was tainted or dirty or broken somehow. And, um, and that part just hurt me so much because I didn't feel like I was heard and I didn't have any kind of like support or healing or discussion about what had happened. Instead, they were just pretending it never happened um, in my mind, right? In my mind. But to them, it was just like, you know, how do we do this? Like, it was very hard for them to have to kind of um, work on those things uh, with me because they didn't know how and their cultural um, leaning was to say it didn't happen. Uh, or to try to make it seem like everything was fine, everything was normal. And they yelled at me about my grades when they were plummeting rather than talk to me about what was causing me to be so upset, right? And so I think like that was kind of like what was the cultural norm rather than what was, um, what would be, you know, now like if we're discussing this with my mom and dad, they would be like, oh, you know, it would be a very different conversation. But, um, but that was what it was before when they were, you know, new immigrants, first kid, they didn't know. I mean, I think this is the why the sets of things that you're proposing to put on the legislative agenda is so important. Because right now, I mean, it really just falls to whatever context of a family you happen to grow up in. And, you know, the really difficult story that you just told us is like, sadly, not one that's like totally unique. I mean, there are lots of other people who have had this exact same experience. And, you know, this is where our collective responsibility comes in. And, you know, the idea of comprehensive sex ed is like, it's comprehensive and it starts at a young age so that young people know that they can and should have these conversations. And it doesn't mean at a young age, we're telling young kids like four-year-olds about how to have sex. It means we're teaching them really, really basic lessons like, you know, you have the right to your own bodily autonomy and like, you know, don't grab, use your words. And, you know, there are these like really kind of fundamental lessons that young people get all the time. And one of the things that we have to do is bridge 
lessons of sex and sexual, sexual education with those fundamental life lessons of how it is to treat other people with human dignity and respect. And, you know, Jennifer and I are not moralistic at all about the kinds of sex that people have. Like, you know, we're kind of like, if you want to hook up, hook up, live your best life. If you, you know, like where a lot of people focus their morality on who somebody's having sex with, like whether it's a queer relationship and that's acceptable or their gender identity, like that is not where our morality is focused. Our morality is focused on the fundamental question of human dignity and the respect for human dignity and the kind of experience that you had where, you know, an experience of a violation of your own autonomy and then a further sort of denial of what it is you needed and wanted and having that kind of victim and survivor center approach, I think is absolutely essential. Um, as well as helping young people who are going to grow up in, you know, in this state of New York, in the city of New York, with such diverse experiences in terms of their families. I mean, you know, my parents are both immigrants, my dad from Pakistan, my mom from Ireland, like they met in Flatbush in Brooklyn. Like, you know, it is not, you know, it was like a very, very different, if not the context that the book describes of what we think parents should be doing for raising up kids. But, you know, this is where communities can step in, religious organizations can step in, you know, the state can step in to help provide a firmer foundation. And one of the points of the book is that like, it shouldn't be parents' job to deal with this. It's everyone's job. It's not just legislature's job, it's everyone's job. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I mean, I think that there is a big part in the legislature that does that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and now that we have you here, I mean, it's like, you know, we, we've, <laughs> we've got you doing this incredible work with, you know, all of your colleagues, I think. And I, I think you can, I think you can also think about comprehensive sex ed as workforce development, right? Because not everyone ends up going to college and not everyone goes to a fancy college that has lots of time for programming. In fact, most people don't go, most people live at home um, going to college. And so if you're interested in stopping work, workplace sexual harassment, you have 12 years when you have everyone in America in an institution and we could be spending a lot more time teaching them how not to grab at other people, right? Like that as a sort of fundamental lesson of sexual citizenship, that other people's bodies don't belong to you. Other people's bodies don't belong to you. I mean, this is something that is so fundamental because we, I mean, think about it. All the stuff that we're talking about right now, what we were just talking about with power. I mean, the sexual assault, sexual violence has been used um, culture to culture, uh, you know, generation to generation, um, and, uh, you know, civilization to civilization um, as ways of being able to dominate control, power, um, has been kind of the center of it all. And I still, I mean, one of the things that you talked about, and I mean, this is going to go into one of the questions that one of the audience members is asking, but um, so at the very beginning in your intro, there's a portion here about the history of sexual assault activism. Um, and I think that, you know, folks uh, right now in this current environment that we're, um, you know, much more conscientious about some of the things that are going on, uh, that have been going on constantly and forever, um, you know, about, you know, racial violence and some of the things that are going on there. But it's, uh, you know, we talk about how America's history has also, you know, revealed some of history and sexual violence um, within racial inequality and, and some of the things within our laws that obviously, you know, have been in a lot of different forms of um, sexual violence, I think, in a lot of ways because uh, a lot of laws that were um, about whether or not black men could look at white women or things like that, you know, and I think that, you know, we, you talked a little bit about Rosa Parks and you talked about African-American women. I mean, I would talk about about some of the labor practices that kind of, um, you know, have evolved, um, you know, based off of uh, the treatment of the women of color who have been in the factories here, you know, including the biological factory. factory. Um, and I think that, you know, there's been um, a lot of those discussions. I would love to be able to kind of um, hit on that a little bit because, uh, oh, I should read the question for, from, from somebody who wrote that. Um, same last name as you. <laughs> sexual violence is one an asymmetric abuse of power and a 
to not seeing the victim as a person with the right to be heard and respected, what have you learned in writing this book from a social science perspective that you see applicable to the George Floyd asymmetric abuse of power that has set off a, na a national debate? How are they the same and different? I mean, race is fundamental to understanding sexual violence in America. I think, you know, not everyone knows uh, what you mentioned, that Rosa Parks began her career as um, a rape prevention specialist for the NAACP. Uh, every single black woman that we spoke with in, in, the, in the research, and I just want to underline that, every single one had experienced unwanted, non-consensual sexual touching. So you can't understand sexual people, violence. Like said before, people didn't believe that their bodies were there. Yes, exactly. They, they were um, they, they just, and that's, so I think if you only think about that if through a lens of gender, you're missing the racism, right? Which means all the sessions in the world on consent are not going to be effective at preventing that kind of sexual violence because that sexual kind of sexual violence is about racism. So I think, yeah, the fundamental question that power is expressed by um, a notion of entitlement to other people's bodies. And that circles back to what Seamus said earlier, that um, sexual assault prevention work requires a commitment to equality. It's not just about, you can't only try to prevent sexual assault absent doing broader racial justice work. Yeah, and I think, you know, Jennifer and I kind of try and stay in our lane a little bit in terms of, you know, we like to be sort of a little, a little bit like scholars who know something about the particular research that we did. But, I, you know, I think um, in terms of extending this to George Floyd, or the, the example of, you know, the, every single black woman having an experience of unwanted sexualized touching, we also heard, you know, uniquely from black men, the willingness of women to walk up to them in bars and grab their penises. And, you know, men sort of, two men told us this story and in a kind of like astonishment at the degree to which their body in some ways wasn't their body. It was an object for other people to touch and prod and like experiment with in ways that they wanted to. And the fact that only black students told us this tells you something about, you know, Columbia is a very, very progressive student body, but the sensibility within that community that like, Black bodies were not autonomous bodies with human subjects that were res deserved equal respect and human dignity, but instead, you know, something that you could touch just because you wanted to. That tells you something deep about the character and nature of race in America. It's interesting because, I mean, in a microcosm of um, just the campus, you can see some of that, but I mean, even further, I mean, I think that there's something that um, has happened before with, uh, you know, conversations that um, my friends and I have had about hair, about hair. And, like, I, I know that that's such a strange thing, but, um, you know, people come up to me and touch my hair all the time. You know, they just think that it's something that's totally okay. And that happens a lot to my black friends as well. They say, like, hey, you know, like, people just come up to me and touch my hair. They just think it's okay to touch it and feel it. And I think that that's something that, is like very much a part of that conversation. And it's like, a, it's a, a uh, um, when you, whenever you look on the internet, if there's like something that's like a list of, of things that, um, you know, you, you would say like, oh, this is your experience as like, you know, do you ever see those lists online? It's like, this is your experience as a black person. This is your experience as an Asian person. This is your, it's like listed as one of the things. And I just always thought that that was a very interesting thing. And I think that that has something to do with it as well as, um, you know, that whole feeling of being able to, somebody else's body feeling like it's totally okay to touch them somehow. And so all of those things would fall into the bucket of things that students would learn about in comprehensive sex ed, right? It's not only like in the same way that to drive a car, it doesn't really matter if you know how the spark plugs work. Sure. That, like comprehensive sex ed is not really like good comprehensive sex ed is not really about like ovaries and fallopian tubes. It's really about human relations and um, the social and emotional learning. And so that fundamental notion of respecting other people's right to physical self-determination and sexual self-determination, like that's what, that's what young people can get in school with comprehensive sex ed. And if they get it 
year after year, starting in kindergarten, like sit in circle time, keep your hands on your own body. Right. Um, and it's repeated. Yes, yourself, children. <laughs> exactly. Right. Like that is the fundamental lesson of kindergarten. So like if they get that many years, by the time they've graduated from high school, they will have learned it. And, and, you know, yes, certainly like that's something that parents should reinforce, but, um, parents are quite variable in, in what they can convey to their children, um, based on their own backgrounds. And so if we're going to build a society where there's less sexual violence, it's got to start with work at the, it, it, at social, at our shared social institutions, not, um, uh, only at home. What are some other things that you think that the legislature should be doing besides the comprehensive sex ed, just besides Aaron's law, besides, you know, um, some of the sexual assault and sexual harassment prevention um, that we are doing now within, um, you know, our legislation? I mean, first and foremost, even within our law of uh, trying to do sexual assault and sexual prevention in the workplace, we were awesome and cut ourselves out of that. You know, that was a good thing move. Um, but I just wanted to, <laughs> I just wanted to um, you know, kind of tap your brains on some of the things that we should be doing now um, besides just those kinds of pieces that we um, have seen kind of already uh, being talked about across the nation. Well, when you pass single payer in New York State, it's a when. It's a when. It's a when, right. When you pass that, please make sure that young people have the right to confidential medical care because mm -hmm. there, you know, it, it, if you can't get an IUD without going through your parents, how can you chart your own course as, as a young woman at risk of, as a, as a young person with a uterus, right? And so, um, or if you can't uh, get a pregnancy termination because you can't afford it. Um, so th there really is, I, I don't think that um, medical care is um, going to get us all the way there, but it's a very important recognition of young people's sexual citizenship that they can access safe, confidential, affordable, gender affirming sexual and reproductive health care. Um, um, oh, go ahead. No, no, please go ahead. Oh, I was going to say one of the things that I had the hardest time with, and maybe this is something that you know, since you exist on the Columbia campus and we've had these conversations, I felt like that was, it would have been really awesome to have had that, um, you know, that available. Um, but one of the things that I didn't feel supported in with um, high school <laughs> was definitely that there was not a lot of counselors on campus that were trained to talk about the things that, you know, students need to talk about regarding um, sexual assault, sexual violence, sexual harassment, and especially not within, um, know, the context of school. And I think that, you know, there's a, a probably something that we can do on the legislative level on that front as well. Absolutely. I mean, I, I'll say two things here. I mean, the, the role of counseling and mental health services is incredibly important. But one of the perspectives we also take in the book is thinking beyond a kind of one-on-one -on -one interaction. Like, you know, you need more counselors in school or you need more counseling services available. I certainly think that's important. But I think, you know, one of the things that was shocking to Jennifer and I as we were doing this research, um, with Jennifer and me, was that um, the community mental health burden that was sort of experienced by students, you know, most people don't report their assaults. They don't tell teachers. They don't tell their RA. They don't tell anybody to get the university but almost everybody tells someone. And what that means is that most people tell their friends. And there were lots of stories that we heard where young people that had experienced an assault, they went to go talk to their friends about it. And their friend told them an even more brutal story of assault, where some people said like, I couldn't talk to my friends because everybody's so emotionally tabbed out. And so I think when thinking about providing mental health to young people, one of the things to think about is like, what is a community level mental health project looks like? Like, so how do we think about mental health? But is it just about providing more counseling and instead creating healthy spaces? One of the concepts in the book is sexual geographies. And that's the idea that 
you know, a critical lever of power is having control over space, um, you know, physical space on campus. And one of the ways in which campus is a kind of white institution is that this campus spaces are primarily, they're sort of predominantly controlled by white heterosexual men. And, you know, I think thinking about like, how is it that we could use sort of the vast amount of public space that is available to us to empower sort of communities of color, queer communities, et cetera, where, you know, those communities, like, you know, the queer community has like fought to have space free of aggressive policing. I mean, this is what Stonewall was all about. It's like, you know, queer, gender queer people fighting um, and people of color fighting for this capacity to have that sort of space. And so I would wonder like, you know, could we think creatively about things that would allow access to and more control over public spaces with communities of color? And could we ask about, like, what a mental health project would look like that took a kind of community-level approach? I'll say one last thing on this. Jennifer and I took tours of the dorms um, on campus with um, uh, one of the young people who was part of an undergraduate advisory board of ours. And we asked him at one point, you know, what's the best thing that ever happened in here? And he said, he looked at it, kind of like looked off for a second and he said, I think it's when they brought in the therapy dogs. And he said that part. They were like puppies. Right? But the like, puppies. Honestly, like we got kind of a hard time about this from our editor and other people that were like, Billy, therapy dogs. And we're like, well, actually, yes. Like dogs are like, it's a, but it's like a community level mental health intervention. And thinking like creatively about what you could sort of, what it would look like in different communities to think about mental health as more than just counseling, um, as, as, as something that also exists at this community level that may alleviate some of those community level mental health burdens could be a kind of creative way of thinking through some public policies on this. And well, one of the things, I mean, so first off, I, I can't believe that this is, I mean, I, I didn't, uh, I'm glad I asked this question because I didn't even think that that was something that uh, was on your radar. Because I was actually going to bring it up that when I was um, in college, I went to Evergreen State College, and um, I actually ran something called the Women of Color Coalition. And we were, um, we were at this, like, you know, Evergreen's, like, not the granola school, you know. It's, <laughs> it's, it's called Evergreen for a reason. You know, um, and so I think that, you know, we were a little bit different um, on that front, but I think that there was there was no difference in the uh, part where there was a lot of sexual assault, sexual harassment on campus, and there was a lot of things that was, um, you know, uh, not healthy on campus. And there were a lot of power dynamics that still were the same everywhere. And we, but, but one of the things that we did do was to form the Women of Color Coalition and um, and it was a student group on campus that we felt like it wasn't just the Women's Resource Center. It wasn't just, you know, um, uh, a, another school group. And it wasn't just, you know, one of those um, groups that, like, did mountain climbing or biking or one of the student groups that, you, like you said, were run by white women. And um, a lot of the funding went to those groups, um, whereas, like, we didn't get a lot of funding. Um, and I found, I, and I found that, you know, it was really interesting because, um, actually creating that space and talking about the issues that, um, and, and not even just talking about them, but just showing up and having something happen. Um, so one of the things that we ended up doing because, um, <laughs> for International Women's Week, which we, you know, we, when you talked about Rosa Parks in the book, I was like, you know, what, what's missing is also some of the international things that actually impacted, like Gabriella in the Philippines, um, the, the Nepalese, like women who were doing the co-ops, et cetera, helping. Because, and, but it was all because of sexual violence. And, um, you know, it was, they, they formed and their movements were based off of uh, preventing sexual assault, preventing sexual violence in those countries, you know, and that's why there was feminism um, in those countries before here. And um, I think that, you know, one of the things that uh, kind of, Brought, was brought to my awareness was like when we were doing International Women's Week, um, there was uh, funding for the Women's Resource Center to do events, and there was none for the Women of Color Coalition. And it was International <laughs> Women's Week, right? And so what we did was we just took tons of butcher paper and we wrote quotes from famous women of color um, activists, and we just dropped them 
huge banners of them into um, the school's courtyard. We put them everywhere. And, and that was all during Women, uh, Inter International Women's Week. And we just didn't go to any of the events. And we just left those there for them. And so that they could think about it, right? And justify us doing that, um, I, it was not based off of anything else other than that one thing that we did. Um, there were so many students who started to come just to the Women of Color Coalition to speak about, and, and it was unprompted. Nobody knew my experience. Nobody knew the experience of my other um, sisters who were also, you know, genderqueer or, um, or, or queer or uh, had any kind of, uh, you know, sexual assault happen to them. Nobody knew anything of, about that, but it was, um, for some reason, the safe space for everyone to come to talk about their experiences with sexual assault on campus. Um, and it was a strange thing to have happen, but it was also something that really kind of echoed and paralleled what you were saying with need on campus. I, I mean, that's totally um, resonates with our much more expansive approach to what sexual assault prevention could look like. If you think about the story that I told earlier about Scott and Lucy, what if it wasn't just older students who had better housing, right? The spatial inequalities on campus, as you were saying, are built into campus life, but that means they can be built out of campus life, Correct. right? So thinking about, in the same way that there's such enormous inequality in parks and libraries across New York City, so that better people have better everything, right? It's the same, campuses are a micro, microcosm of that. And so wealthier students and older students have better spaces with where they, where they can host parties. But so those are both at the city and at the campus level. Those are things that we could change. Once you see how space is an index of social power, let's turn that around. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. And also um, I think that, you know, when you were saying um, that almost everyone talks to someone, that that was a very interesting thing to hear about. I mean, I talked to no one for 20 years, <laughs> but, but it was still, uh, you know, I think that that was something that is uh, really awesome because, you know, uh, we know, we know the numbers for unreported cases of sexual assault and sexual violence. Um, and uh, it was also really sad to hear when you said that students were having a hard time talking to their friends because everyone was passed out. Like, they literally just couldn't handle it. Yeah, it was like literally a phrase somebody said, like, you know, I tried to talk to my friends about it, but everyone was just sort of tapped out. And I think, you know, this is where, you know, to bring it back full circle, the prevention approach really comes in. You know, um, there's a lot of different kinds of work that needs to happen on sexual assault. And sexual citizens doesn't do all of the work that's needed. What it's focusing on is like, how do we just make assault less likely? We're not going to prevent all the assaults from happening. The sociopathic per like predators out there, our book isn't really great at addressing that kind of assault. For many other kinds of assault, we think we can move the needle pretty dramatically and make it so that people aren't as tapped out by this kind of experience. Make it so that the community mental health burden isn't that great. Make it so that like, you know, um, people maybe have a greater capacity to be there for one another or feel like they can go to their friends. And, you know, Jennifer said at the beginning, and I just want to say this again, like the book is hard to read, but it's really written from a perspective of empathy and hope. Like when we were writing the book, we were thinking like, what, are the, what is the theme we want to take, we want a reader to take away? And it's not like be afraid, be very, very afraid. The world is very scary. It's like, actually, we need an empathetic understanding of one another and we need to have hope that we can do this. And Jennifer and I really come from that place of empathy and hope and thinking like, I have to say, so inspired by the young people that we spoke to, so inspired. I think like, you know, people like me who are a little older kind of need to get out of the way and play a supporting role in the world that young people want to usher in as a way to sort of like say, draw on me and my experience. But like, I think it's time for that group to lead. And so I think like, this is what we're super excited about. And I, and I love the, there was one part of the book and I just can't, I can't find it, but I was looking for a little bit earlier, but where you guys said that um, it was so important to um, think with humanity 
right? What you're trying to teach is like that every single person humanity is important. Um, and I thought that that was something really cool. Yeah. I think we've reached seven thirty, have we? Yes, seven thirty four, exactly. Um if there if there's any other questions from the audience, you know, I just wanted to let folks be able to have a moment to ask, but I also wanted to just say thank you. Uh, I think that this is an incredibly important discussion and I've like wrote down all these notes about um, things that we could do in the future. Uh, but I also think that, you know, we have obviously a lot to do. And I think that, you know, one of, one last question for the two of you, um, if uh, none of the audience folks want to chime in, they can just put it into the chat. We can also chime in right after. Um, but when, when you're writing the book, there's a lot of um, normalizing of, not normalizing, but it's more like you're, you're coming from where they're coming from, right? So you're telling the story from where they think is um, their, within their context. Um, but then uh, I think that, you know, we see on campuses that there's almost like a normalizing, this is where the normalizing part comes in, but the normalizing of uh, sexual assault and violent behaviors being okay or being a part of campus life, right? And then we also um, uh, see that uh, the the language is very important. Um, so what is it that we can do to make it so that folks realize that those things should not be normal, are not normal, and, um, and yet um, take it from a place where uh, we're coming from their context? Um, I think you're going to think I'm like a broken record here, but um, I think really the, our main policy lever here is comprehensive sex ed because you can't expect students to recognize bad behavior if they've never been permitted to imagine good behavior, right? And so if the only message they get their whole lives is not under my roof, don't touch yourself there, that's disgusting, that's dirty. You know, if, if they grow up in a home where parents won't use the word penis or vulva, but call it like hoochie coochie or whatever people call it. Um, the message they get is, is that it's dirty and dangerous and disgusting. And then when something bad happens, that's kind of what they were expecting all along. And so we are reproducing that culture of vulnerability by refusing to acknowledge young people's sexual citizenship. What Jennifer? would happen? Yeah, I think that's, I mean, Jennifer and I share a brain at this point, but I think like, what would happen if instead of conveying to young people about how scary sex is, where sex ed is about the diseases that you're going to get or the unwanted pregnancy that may happen, instead we sat people down and said, you know, sex is going to be a really important part of your life. It's going to be one of the ways in which you connect with some people who are most important to you. Really think about what you want from that and think about how you want to be treated and how you want to treat other people in that situation. And I think that is the conversation that we need to have. And that is the conversation that, you know, we as a political community and as a social community need to be pushing for. And just, I would say a PS as a mom. Um, I think that the mom parent thing that we can do is acknowledge that when our children are growing up, that becoming sexual with intimate partners is part of that. And so to parents who can be down with this. I'm a big supporter of the sleepover. Um, and yeah, like, I mean, so that you say to your kid, you know what, when you're in a relationship with someone, you care about each other. If you want to bring your partner over, if they're comfortable having dinner with us, then they're also invited for breakfast. Like that is a very profound message to your child that says, I see you. And I acknowledge that like, you are journeying off into the land of adulthood, and I but want you to be happy. Pass out right now. Well, well, well I mean, <laughs> this is not going to happen in everyone's family. <laughs> but I think fundamentally, like, when you say not under my roof, what you get is in someone else's backseat, right? It doesn't keep them from having sex. It just communicates to them that you don't want to know about it, which means they won't turn to you when they need you. That's right. My mom is like, Make room for Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else have any questions? I think we're going to close up if you don't. All right. Okay. Well, thank you so, so much. Thank you to McNally's for hosting. And I just want to say thank you to um, both of you for this awesome conversation. Thank you so much for, for making time for um, 
for sharing some of your precious brain space and some of your heart with us is really just like an honor, a delight. Um, we're big fans. Um, and we just make it so comfortable, you know, it's like end up saying things that I'm like, Oh, I, did I say that? <laughs> well, you see professors are people too, you know, yeah. <laughs> Um, everybody out there, thank you for, for being with us tonight. Um, we're still on tour. Um, paperback version comes out in January. So, um, find us, uh, Twitter, Facebook, um, at your local community center when we rejoin the world. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Folks, this is an incredible, incredible book. I, I had to piece it out. Um, the first section is the most difficult to read for survivors. Um, but I do want to say that, uh, you know, it's a, it's, it's something that I was very glad to pick up and read. Um, it took me three days to read it. Uh, it took me three sections, three chunks. I had it and it was paced out, but it is such a good read, such an important read. And I think that it's a conversation that all of America needs to have. So I wanted to thank Jennifer. I want to thank Seamus for doing it for us and for making it so that, you know, young people, people like me, um, uh, folks who are older like me, uh, folks can talk about some of these things that uh, have happened to them or um, that happened to somebody they knew or, um, you know, have uh, even been the, you know, people who have uh, caused somebody else harm, you know. So I think that, you know, this is an important book to read and it is uh, something that is helping us to spawn conversations uh, around the country uh, that we desperately need to have, especially now. So thank you so much.